Between January 29th, 1916 and February 8th, 1916, a period of 11 days, Dr. Carl Jung had a series of active imaginations which emerged as the seven sermons to the dead. Now, the significance of the seven sermons of the dead um, was Dr. Jung covered in a footnote uh, or is covered in a footnote that was provided to us by uh, Dr. Sono Shamdasani. He says, on the significance of the sermons that follow, Jung said to Agnella Yaffe that the discussions with the dead formed the prelude to what would subsequently, to what he would subsequently communicate to the world and that their content anticipated his later books. From that time on, the dead have become ever more distinct for me as the voices of the unanswered, unresolved, and unredeemed. The questions he was required to answer did not come from the world around him, but from the dead. One element that astonished him was the fact that the dead appeared to know no more than they did when they died. One would have assumed that they would have attained greater knowledge since death. This explained the tendency of the dead to encroach upon life, and why in China important family events have to be reported to the ancestors who felt that the dead were waiting for the answers of the living. Now, um, this first sermon that, uh, well, let me first say that in my own lifetime, my grandfather had a very rough life and he lost a business because of the 1929 crash and he struggled through the Great Depression raising three children Oh, let's see. Can't hear me. Can any, can every anyone else hear me? You may need to turn up your own volume, Art. Okay. Let me just check this thing a minute. <laughs> Okay, I'm hearing on this end, but, um, okay, so Xbox J Pro 3 says he can hear, so I'm going to, pre I can proceed. Okay, so my grandfather uh, had a rough life. He lost a business in 1929, and uh, ultimately he became an alcoholic. Um, and he didn't really know why he lost his business and and his life basically i mean he lived to be 68 but he was an alcoholic and a very sad one and so lately about the last 10 or 15 years since i've read the seven sermons i have come to ask myself the questions that he wanted answered and so when we're talking about psychic phenomenon here, psychological phenomenon in Dr. Jung's context, um, those questions that were questions of my grandfather uh, became my questions. And although I didn't realize it, I mean, it, it, it evolved into that. And so, um, So anyway, and now in the third generation or second generation from my grandfather, I have some answers and I'll provide them at a later date. But here I want to make you aware of Dr. of the answers Dr. Jung was searching for. And so in order to do that, um, 
you first, in order to understand uh, the first one, Dr. Jung was talking about a complex psychological organism. Okay, Dr. Edward Edinger explained to us in uh, the Ion Lectures by Dr. Edward Edinger. Um, he, he describes complex psychological organisms and how they work. And in order to understand what Dr. Jung is saying in the first sermon, uh, you need to understand the term pleroma. Pleroma. I'll put it into the chat here so that you can see it. All right, everyone else seems to um, be able to hear, so it seems to be something on your end. Um, okay, so in the introduction to this book, uh, Edward Edinger's Ion Lectures, he described what the pleroma means, okay? And so I'm going to read that definition of pleroma. In invisible and nameless heights, there was a perfect eon pre-existent. His name was Forebeginning, Forefather, and Abyss. This is the original primordial deity named Ion. No thing can comprehend him. Through immeasurable eternities, he remained in profoundest repose. With him was thought, also called grace and silence. And once this abyss took thought to project out of himself the beginning of all things, and he sank this project like a seed into the womb of the silence and was with him, and she conceived and brought forth the mind, nous, male, who is like the equal to his begetter and alone comprehends the greatness of the father. He is also called only begotten, father, and beginning of all beings. Together with him, truth, Alatea, female, was produced, and this was the first tetrad, abyss and silence, then mind and truth. This first tetrad is a pair of two syzygies. A syzygy means a pair. Further ions were generated out of the second pair. From them came man and church, which is again male-female pair, and word and life. This then gave a total of four syzygies, and that was called the Ogdode, the first eight. These eons produced to the glory of the Father, wished to glorify the Father by their own creations, and produced further emanations. From word and life issued ten additional eons, from man and church twelve, so that out of eight and ten and twelve is constituted thirty eons in fifteen pairs, and that totality was called the pleroma. Okay, so the this is the pleroma in terms of how the psyche develops. Okay, so now I'm on page, um, you know, not on that page, but I will go to it. I'm on page uh, 507 of the reader's edition of the Red Book. And um, so Dr. Young has been experimenting. This is January 29th, 1916. So Dr. Young has been experimenting with active imagination for three years at this point. And so he's well into it. And and so his soul has been silent. And so here's how he's, here's how he begins. And my soul remained silent and was not to be seen. 
but one night a dark crowd knocked at my door and tremble and i trembled with fear now keep in mind this is an act of imagination so this wasn't happening in the physical world it was happening in dr jung's psyche but one night a dark crowd knocked at my door and i trembled with fear then my soul appeared and said in haste they are here and will tear open your door so that the wicked herd can break into my garden should i be plundered and thrown out onto the street you make me into an ape and a child's plaything when oh my god shall i be saved from this hell of fools but i want to hate i want to hack to pieces your cursed webs go to hell you fools what do you want with me but she interrupted me and said what are you talking about let the dark one speak. I retorted, how can I trust you? You work for yourself, not for me. What good are you if you can't even protect me from the devil's confusion? Be quiet, she replied, or else you'll disturb the work. And as she spoke these words, behold, Philemon came up to me, dressed in the white robe of a priest, and lay his hand on my shoulder. Then I, then I said to the dark ones, So speak, you dead. And immediately they cried in many voices. We have come back from Jerusalem, where we did not find what we sought. We implore you to let us in. You have what we desire, not your blood, but your light. That is it. Okay, so um, there's a footnote here, and um, there's some background, which is the dead are the dead Anabaptists led by Ezekiel. Uh, we're heading to Jerusalem to, to pray at the holy places, and uh, there's a reference back to uh, page 335, so I'll just read, read that to you. So there, there's an earlier uh, sequence where he's talking to these Anabaptists as they're leaving uh, for Jerusalem. Where are you rushing off to? I call out bearded man with tousled hair and dark shining eyes stops and turns toward me we are wandering to jerusalem to pray at the most holy sepulcher take me with you you cannot join us you have a body but we are dead who are you i am ezekiel and i am an anabaptist who are those wandering with you these are my fellow believers why are you wandering? We cannot stop, but must make a pilgrimage to all the holy places. What drives you to this? I don't know, but it seems that we still have no peace, although we died in true belief. Why do you have no peace if you died in true belief? It always seems to me as if I had not come to the proper end with my life. Remarkable, how so? It seems to me that we forgot something important that should also have been lived. And what was that? Would you happen to know? With these words, he reached out greedily and uncannily toward me, his eyes shining as if it were inner heat. Let go, demon. You did not live your animal. Okay, so um, then there's a footnote here. The biblical Ezekiel was a prophet in the 6th century bef uh, before Christ. Jung saw a great deal of historical significance in his visions, which incorporated a mandala with four quaternities, or with quaternities, as representing the humanization and differentiation of Yahweh. Although Ezekiel's visions are often viewed as pathological, 
Jung defended their normality, arguing that visions are natural phenomena that can be designated as pathological only when their morbid aspects have been demonstrated. Anabaptism was a radical movement of the 16th century Protestant Reformation, which tried to restore the spirit of the early church. The movement originated in Zurich in the 1520s, where they re rebelled against Zwingli and Luther's reluctance to completely reform the church. They rejected the practice of infant ba baptism and promoted adult baptisms. The first of these took place in Zalakon, which is near Kusnacht, where Jung lived. Anabaptists stressed the immediacy of the human relation with God and were critical of religious institutions. The movement was violently suppressed and thousands were killed. In 1918, Jung argued that Christianity had suppressed the animal element, and uh, this is in his essay on the unconscious, which is in Collected Works 10, paragraph 31. He elaborated this theme in his 1923 seminars in Cornwall. In 1939, he argued that the psychological sin which Christ committed was that he did not live the animal side of himself. And that was in Modern Psychology 4, page 230. Okay, so that's the background. So I'll go back and read this work up now. Now that you know what a pleroma is, and now that you know what the Anabaptists are and who it was that was coming back from Jerusalem where they did not find what they sought. Then Philemon lifted his voice and taught them, saying, and this is the first sermon of the dead. Now here I begin with nothingness. Nothingness is the same as the fullness. In infinity, full is as good as empty. Nothingness is empty and full. You might just as well say anything else about nothingness. For instance, that it is white or black, or that it does not exist, or that it exists. That which is endless and eternal has no qualities, since it has all qualities. We call this nothingness or fullness the pleroma. Therein, both thinking and being cease, since the eternal and endless possess no qualities. No one is in it, for he would then be distinct from the pleroma and would possess qualities that would distinguish him as something distinct from the pleroma. In the pleroma, there is nothing and everything. It is fruitless to think about the pleroma for this would mean self-dissolution. would be self-dissolution because they're all of these uh, opposites, syzygies, and if they're in equal measure against one another, they cancel each other out. Creation is not in the pleroma, but in itself. The pleroma is the beginning and end of creation. It pervades creation, just as the sunlight per pervades the air. Although the pleroma is altogether pervasive, creation has no share in it, just as a wholly transparent body becomes neither light nor dark through the light pervading it. We are, however, the pleroma itself, for we are a part of the eternal and the endless but we have no share therein, as we are infinitely removed from the Pleroma, not spatially or temporally, but essentially, since we are distinguished from the Pleroma in our essence as creation, which is confined, which is confined within time and space. Yet because we are parts of the Pleroma, the Pleroma is also in us, even in the smallest point, the pleroma is endless, eternal, and whole, 
since small and great are qualities that are contained in it. It is nothingness that is whole and continuous throughout. Only figuratively, therefore, do I speak of creation as part of the Pleroma, because actually the Pleroma is nowhere divided, since it is nothingness. We are also the whole Pleroma, because figuratively the Pleroma is the smallest point in us, merely assumed, not existing, and the boundless firmament about us. But why then do we speak of the Pleroma at all, if it is everything and nothing? I speak about it in order to begin somewhere, and also to free you from the delusion that somewhere without or within there is something fixed or in some way established from the outset. Every so-called fixed and certain thing is only relative. That alone is fixed and certain that is subject to change. And just remember FDR's quote, the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. So carrying on with Jung, that alone is fixed and certain that is subject to change. Creation, however, is subject to change. Therefore, it alone is fixed and determined because it has qualities. Indeed, it is quality itself. Thus we ask, how did the creation come into being? Creatures came into being, but not creation, since creation is the very quality of the pleroma as much as non-creation, eternal death. Creation is ever-present, and so is death. The pleroma has everything, differentiation and non-differentiation. Differentiation is creation. It is differentiated. Differentiation is its essence, and therefore it differentiates. Therefore man differentiates, since his essence is differentiation. Therefore he also differentiates the qualities of the pleroma that do not exist. He differentiates them on account of his own essence. Therefore he must speak of those qualities of the pleroma that do not exist. You say, what use is there in speaking about it at all? Did you yourself not say that it is not worth thinking about the pleroma? I mentioned that to free you from the del I mentioned that to free you from the delusion that we are able to think about the pleroma. When we distinguish the qualities of the pleroma, we are speaking about the ground of our own differentiated state and about our own differentiation but have effectively said nothing about the Pleroma. Yet we need to speak about our own differentiation so that we may sufficiently differentiate ourselves. Our very nature is differentiation. If we are not true to this nature, we do not differentiate ourselves enough. We must therefore make distinctions between qualities. You ask, what harm is there in not differentiating oneself? If we do not differentiate, we move beyond our essence, beyond creation, and we fall into non-differentiation, which is the other quality of the Pleroma. We fall into the Pleroma itself and cease to be created beings. We lapse into dissolution in nothingness. This is the death of the creature. Therefore, we die to the same extent that we do not differentiate. Hence, the creature's essence strives toward differentiation and struggles against primeval, perilous sameness. This is called the, princip this is called the principium individuationis. This principle is the essence of the creation. For this, you can see non-differentiation and non-distinction pose a great danger to the creature. Okay, so here Dr. Jung is already talking about individuation uh, as a necessity. He goes on. We must therefore distinguish the qualities of the pleroma 
These qualities are pairs of opposites, such as the effective and the ineffective, the fullness and the emptiness, the living and the dead, the different and the same, light and darkness, hot and cold, force and matter, time and space, good and evil, the beautiful and the ugly, the one and the many, etc. The pairs of opposites are the qualities of the pleroma that do not exist because they cancel themselves out. As we are the pleroma itself, we also have all these qualities in us. Since our nature is grounded in differentiation, we have these qualities in the name and under the sign of differentiation, which means, first, these qualities are differentiated and separate and separate in us, therefore they do not cancel each other out, but are effective. Thus we are the victims of the pairs of opposites. The pleroma is rent within us. So here Dr. Jung is talking about a main feature of psychic energy, which he discusses for the next 40 years uh, as the problem of the opposites. Second, these qualities belong to the pleroma, and we must possess and live them only in the name and under the sign of differentiation. We must differentiate ourselves from these qualities. They cancel each other out in the pleroma, but not in us. Distinction from them saves us. When we strive for the good or the beautiful, we forget our essence, which is differentiation, and we fall subject to the spell of the qualities of the pleroma, which are the pairs of opposites. We endeavor to attain the good and the beautiful, yet at the same time we also seize the evil and the ugly. Since in the pleroma these are one with the good and the beautiful, but if we remain true to our essence, which is differentiation, we differentiate ourselves from the good and the beautiful, and hence from the beautiful and the ugly. And thus we do not fall under the spell of the pleroma, namely into nothingness and disillusion. You object, you said that difference and sameness are also qualities of the pleroma. What is it like if we strive for distinctiveness? Are we in are we in so doing not true to our own nature, and must we nonetheless fall into sameness when we strive for distinctiveness? You must not forget that the pleroma has no qualities. We create these through thinking. If, therefore, you strive for distinctiveness or sameness or any qualities whatsoever, you pursue thoughts that flow to you out of the pleroma, thoughts, namely, concerning the non-existing qualities of the pleroma. Inasmuch as you run after these thoughts, you fall again into the pleroma and attain distinctiveness and sameness at the same time. Not your thinking, but your essence is differentiation. Therefore, you must not strive for what you conceive as distinctiveness, but for your own essence. At bottom, therefore, there is only one striving, namely the striving for one's own essence. And of course, this is the message for, about individuation throughout all of Dr. Young's later writing. If you had this striving, you would not need to know anything about the pleroma and its qualities, and yet you would attain the right goal by virtue of your own essence. Since, however, thought alienates us from our essence, I must teach you that knowledge with which you can br I must teach you that knowledge which you can bridle your thoughts. I'm sorry, let me read that once more. I must teach you that knowledge with which you can bridle your thoughts. The dead faded away grumbling and moaning, and their cries died away in the distance. But I turned to Philemon and said, My father, you utter strange teachings. 
Did not the ancients teach similar things? And was it not a reprehensible heresy, removed equally from love and the truth? And why do you lay such a teaching to this horde, which the night wind swirled up from the dark blood fields of the West? Of course, this is in the midst of World War I. My son, Philemon replied, these dead ended their lives too early. These were seekers and therefore still hover over their graves. Their lives were incomplete since they knew no way beyond the one to which belief had abandoned them. But since no one teaches them, I must do so. That is what love demands since they wanted to hear even if they grumble. But why do I impart this teaching of the ancients? I teach in this way because their Christian faith once discarded and persecuted precisely this teaching, but they repudiated Christian belief and hence were rejected by that faith. They do not know this and therefore I must teach them so that their life may be fulfilled and they can enter into death. But do you, O oh wise Philemon, believe what you teach? My son, Philemon replied, what do you re why do you raise this question? How could I teach what I believe? Who would give me the right to such belief? It is what I know how to say, not because I believe it, but because I know it. If I knew better, I would teach better, but it would be easy for me to believe more. Yet should I teach a belief to those who have discarded belief? And I ask you, is it good to believe something even more if one does not know better? But, I retorted, are you certain that things really are as you say? To this Philemon answered, I do not know whether it is the best that one can know. But I know nothing better, and therefore I am certain these things are as I say. If they were otherwise, I would say something else, since I would know them to be otherwise. But these things are as I know them, since my knowledge is precisely these things themselves. My father, is that your guarantee that you are not mistaken? There are no mistakes in these things, Philemon replied. There are only different levels of knowledge. These things are as you know them, only in your world are things always other than you know them, and therefore there are only mistakes in your world. After these words, Philemon bent down and touched the earth with his hands and disappeared. Okay, so that is the first um, sermon, and um, the next sermon is about uh, we want the the dead want to know about God. Where is God? Is God dead? So that will be tomorrow. I will read the second sermon. Now, just to add, there's a footnote here. Um, in his 1959 BBC TV interview, John Freeman asked Jung. Do you now believe in God? Jung replied, now, difficult to answer. I know, I don't need to believe, I know. Philemon's statement here seems to be the background for this much cited and debated statement. This emphasis on direct experience also accords with classical Gnosticism. Okay, um, now there were a couple of footnotes here, so I'm going to go back and see if I can pull them together. Um, Okay, so back at the very beginning where then Philemon lifted his voice and taught them saying, and this is the first sermon of the dead. 
that's in the text. Um, yeah, I'll just read this footnote in just a minute. <laughs> you, you beat me to the punch, Greg. <laughs> By the way, we have to talk about Edward O. Wilson and uh, consilience. I, I got to a part that is a little troubling, but anyway, going on. Um, footnote. Jung's cal calligraphic and printed versions of the sermons bear the subheading, The Seven Instructions of the Dead, written by Basilides in Alexandria, where the East touches the West. Now, uh, one thing to know is that Dr. Jung published a small pamphlet of the Seven Sermons, and he did it under a pen name, which is Basilides in Alexandria, which was the name of a Gnostic uh, in the third century. And he distributed, distributed it among his um, disciples, and it fell flat, okay? People didn't like it. And he later said that he uh, considered it a youthful mistake because he put out this idea of active imagination, but he hadn't prepared the ground for, for it with his uh, followers. So then he had to go back and write for 40 years in order for anyone to understand it. So, going on with that, translated from the original Greek text in the German language, Basilides was a Christian philosopher in Alexandria in the first part of the second century. Little is known about his life, and only fragments of his teaching have survived, and none in his own hand, which present a cosmogonic myth. For the extant fragments in commentary, see Bentley Leyden's uh, editing of the Gnostic scriptures. According to Charles King, Basilides was by birth an Egyptian. Before his conversion to Christianity, he followed the doctrines of Oriental Gnosis and endeavored to combine the tenets of Christian religion with the Gnostic philosophy. For this purpose, he chose expressions of his own invention and ingenious symbols. According to Leighton, the classic Gnostic myth was the following structure. Act 1. The expansion of a solitary first principle, God, into a full non-physical, spiritual universe. Act 2. Creation of the material universe, including stars, planets, earth, and hell. Act 3 creation of Adam, Eve, and their children. Act 4, subsequent history of the human race. Thus, in its broadest outlines, Jung's sermons is presented in the form analogous to a Gnostic myth. Jung discusses Basilides in Ion. He credits the Gnostics for having found suitable symbolic expressions of the self, and notes that Basilides and Valentinus, and Valentinus allowed themselves to be influenced in a large measure by natural inner experience. They therefore provide, like the alchemists, a veritable mine of information concerning all those symbols arising out of the repercussions of the Christian message. At the same time, their ideas compensate the symmetry of God postulated by the doctrine of the privatio boni, exactly like those well-known modern tendencies of the unconscious to produce symbols of totality for bridging the gap between, conscious, between consciousness and the unconscious. In 1915, he wrote a letter to a friend from his student days, Rudolf Lichtenhahn, who had written a book. From Lichtenhahn's reply dated November 11, it appears that Jung had asked for information concerning the conception of different human characteristics in Gnosticism, 
and their possible correlation with William James's distinction between tough and tender-minded characters. In Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, Jung said, between 1918 and 1926, I had seriously studied the Gnostics, for they too had confronted with the primal world of the unconscious. They had dealt with its contents and images, which were obviously contaminated with the world of drives. Jung was already reading Gnostic literature in the course of preparatory read of the preparatory reading for transfer transformations and symbols of the libido. There has been an extensive body of commentaries concerning the septum sermones, which provides some valuable discussion. However, these should be treated cautiously as they considered the sermones without the benefit of the red book and the black books, and not least Philemon's commentaries, which together provide critical contextual clarification. Um, and by Philemon's commentaries, he's talking about the last few paragraphs that I read in Sermon 1, and there are commentaries at the end of each sermon, and those were added later. Um, Scholars have discussed Jung's relation to Gnosticism and the historical Basilides, others, other possible sources and parallels for some sermones, and the relation of the sermones to Jung's later works. See especially Christian Maler and the Septum Sermones O Morte de Carl Gustav Jung. Um, there's several other works here. And then um, here's a footnote about the pleroma, so let me read that. The pleroma, or fullness, is a term from Gnosticism. It played a central role in the Valentinian system. Hans Jonas states that pleroma is the standard term for the fully explicated manifold of divine characteristics, whose standard number is 30 forming a hierarchy and together constituting the divine realm, as I read from Edinger at the beginning of this video. Uh, Jung said the Gnostics expressed it as pleroma, a state of fullness, where the pairs of opposites, yea and nay, day and night, are together. Then when they become, it is either night or day. In the state of promise, before they become, they are non-existent. There is neither white nor black, good nor bad. In his later writings, Jung used the term to, des to designate a state of pre-existing, a state of pre-existence and potentiality, identifying it with the Tibetan bardo. He must accustom himself to the idea that time is a relative concept and needs to be compensated by the concept of simultaneous bardo, the pleromic, the pleromatic existence of all historical processes. What exists in the pleroma as an eternal process appears in time as per, a, a periodic sequence. That is to say, it is repeated many times in an irregular pattern. The distinction that Jung draws between the Pleroma and the creation has some points of contact with Meister Eckert's differentiation between the Godhead and God. Jung commented on this in Psychological Types, Collected Works 6, paragraph 429 and following. The relation of Jung's Pleroma to Eckhart is discussed in Maillard. In 1955-56, Jung equated the Pleroma with the alchemist Gerhardus Dorn's notion that of Unus Mundus, one world. In Mysterium Conjunctionis, Collected Works 14, paragraph 660, Jung adopted this expression to designate the transcendental postulate of the unity underlying the multiplicity of the empirical world. 
And uh, so I'll leave it at that for that one. Okay, and, and then there's this one on uh, the principle of individuation. Uh, let's see what was said. So in the, in the sermon, it says, hence the creature's essence strives toward differentiation and struggles against primeval, perilous sameness. This is called the Principium Individuationis. And the footnote reads, the Principium, the principium Individuationis is a notion from the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. He defines space and time as the Principium Individuationis, noting that he had borrowed the expression from scholasticism. The, principi the Principium Individuationis was the possibility of multiplicity, the world as will and representation from Schopenhauer from 1819. The term was used by Edward von Hartmann who saw its origin in the unconscious. It designated the uniqueness of each individual set against the all one unconscious. In 1912, Jung wrote, diversity, arrives, diversity arises from individuation. This fact validates an essential part of Schopenhauer's and Hartmann's philosophy in profound psychological terms. In the series of papers and presentations later in 1916, Jung developed his con concept of individuation, the structure of the unconscious, collected work seven, and individuation and collectivity, which is in collected works 18. In 1929, Jung defined it as follows, quote, the concept of individuation plays no minor role in our psychology. Individuation is, in general, the process of the formation and particularization of individual beings, especially the development of the psychological individual as a being distinct from, general, from generality, from collective psychology. Individuation, therefore, is a process of differentiation, having for its goal the development of the individual personality. And that's from Psychological Types, Collected Work 7, Paragraph 758. In the text, he had said, and thus we do not fall under the spell of the pleroma, namely into nothingness and dissolution. The footnote reads, the notion of life and nature being constituted by opposites and polarities featured centrally in the natural philosophy of Schelling. The notion that psychic conflict took the form of a conflict of opposites and that healing represented their rep resolution featured prominently in Jung's later work, um, especially Psychological Types, Collected Works 6, and Mysterium Conjunctionis, Collected Works 14. Um, okay. All right. So that's what I needed to read for today. Um, let me go back and look at the comments here. <laughs> uh, Gray, I'm looking at later comments first. Gray says, uh, Philemon pissed the dead off. <laughs> This is the section Young drew on. This is the section that Young drew on in the BBC interview, as we said. The line about mistakes in this thinking only being in our world has helped me so much with judge not lest ye be judged. I wish Dr. Edinger would have had access to the Red Book. I just 
shivered thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely, because he uh, that was a real loss when Dr. Edinger didn't have the opportunity to comment on it. But that is compensated somewhat by this uh, series called Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, which has uh, two volumes now published. The third volume, I'm told, will, is going into the publisher in February, so it will probably be out in March or April, I suppose. And um, that is a, a series of essays by 50 uh, Jungian analysts, and they've discussed the Red Book from 50 different points of view. And it's so it's like cutting the facets of a beautiful diamond. And it, when you read those essays, which are uh, many of them are profound. The very first one is truly profound, and you can find it on the homepage of this uh, YouTube channel, um, which is in two parts. It's called The Way of What is to Come, and it's by Thomas Arst, who's also the, um, the editor of that series. And uh, that is a truly profound essay urge you all to you know, read that. And so I acknowledge they're not Edinger, but they're also pretty good in, in uh, many of those essays. There's one or two that I'm not terribly thrilled with, but most of them are special. Uh, and, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm glad Art came came back and was able to hear. Uh, Chris says, this is such a strange book. I read it at the end of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. I immediately thought this was Jung's Gnostic side slipping through the seams. Um, well, um, you know, Jung himself understood that people would react to it that way. And... Um, Let's see if I can find the epilogue here. Um, okay, so Jung in 1959 wrote an epilogue uh, to the Red Book. Okay, so this is what I've been reading from. He said, um, I worked on this book for 16 years. Before I read this, I, let me just say that if you look at the book of Job um, and the, Im the imaging that Job was doing and reported in the book of Job, I think this is Dr. Jung's kind of version of that imaging. And because I had a similar experience, although um, not as profound and not relating to uh, psychology, um, that lasted eight months, his lasted five years, um, I understand it myself, okay, in terms of having something emerge from the unconscious that has to come out. And uh, so, uh, this epilogue is quite moving to me. So 1959, I worked on this book for 16 years. My acquaintance with alchemy in 1930 took me away from it. The beginning of the end came in 1928 when Wilhelm sent me the text of the Golden Flower, an alchemical treatise. There the contents of this book found their way into actuality and I could no longer continue working on it. To the superficial observer, it will appear like madness. It would also have developed into one had I not been able to absorb the overpowering force of the original experiences. With the help of alchemy, I could finally arrange them into a whole. I always knew that these experiences contained something precious, and therefore I knew nothing better than to write them down in a precious. 
that is to that is to say costly book and to paint the images that emerged through reliving it all as well as I could. I knew how frightfully inadequate this undertaking was, but despite such but despite much work and many distractions, I remained true to it. Even if another possibility never and then there's a footnote. The transcription was abruptly left off in the middle of a sentence on page 189 of the calligraphic version of the Red Book. This epilogue appears on the next page in Jung's normal handwriting. This, is, this in turn was abruptly left off in the middle of a sentence. So, um, in the great tradition of <laughs> James Joyce and Finnegan's Wake, I guess. Um, so, um, so this book is depicting this five-year period of Jung's visioning period, which was a very, very emotional time for him. It was after uh, he had had his experiences with uh, Sabina Spielrein. He was taking up with Tony Wolf, um, who was his, um, many think his paramour. She was certainly his psychoanalyst for 40 years. And uh, he had broken up with Freud, who he considered to be a father figure. And then on top of that, World War I was starting all around him and all the deaths that were involved in that. And so he felt a, a strong conviction that he needed to try to understand the human psyche as a way to offer something um, about the world and maybe uh, find ways to stop the war. He was unsuccessful, um, but he definitely was very tuned in to the collective unconscious of Europe at the time. Uh, he was very sensitive to it, and he actually discovered the collective unconscious because of World War One, and he said that you know, the first day of World War I, when he was in Aberdeen, Scotland, he was the happiest man on earth because he knew he wasn't crazy and that what he had been visioning for uh, nine months, he had pre had prefiguration dreams of World War I for about nine months, um, was actually happening throughout Europe. So he realized that he had been connected into the collective um, for that event. So, um, Grace is speaking of the precious. Have you ever seen the connection between Jung's Red Book and that of Tol Tolkien? Yes, I have. And, um, you know, there's a, a there's several videos on YouTube of, um, uh, uh, I think it's Becca Tarnas, um, and she is, um, she's the daughter of Richard Tarnas, and um, when the Red Book came out, uh, they had a two-day symposium about it at the Library of Congress, and Rebecca Tarnas, and this is in about 2010, uh, did an excellent discussion of a comparison between the Red Book of uh, C.G. Jung and the work of Tolkien and pointed out that Tolkien too had a Red Book, uh, among many other th things, parallels. And she actually used uh, those parallels as the basis for her PhD thesis. So, um, so there's a lot about that, and uh, and so it's it's an interesting area to study, certainly, especially since we've had the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit in movies, so that people can relate to them. Um, let's see.
Yeah. So in terms of what's going on here, um, Jung is talking about the evolution of each and every one of our psyches. Okay, so the pleroma exists within us. And when he's talking about the differentiation, which I acknowledge was was a little bit much, but the point is that the differentiation, which uh, comes down to individuation, is something that we all must accomplish in our lifetime. And so that's what this first sermon of uh, to the dead uh, was about. And um, so I guess uh, that's good enough for today. I, I am going to try to read the other six sermons in the next six days if possible. Um, and so I'll do the second sermon uh, sometime tomorrow morning. And then in the evening, uh, we'll be having our regular uh, weekly meeting of the group, which will be um, discussing psychology and alchemy, uh, So, which is uh, volume 12 of the Collected Works of C.G. Young. So thank you for joining me tonight, and I will see you soon. And, and by the way, Gray, if you're still there, uh, we, we need to talk about uh, consilience. Um, but I'm not quite finished. I'm about halfway through, so maybe in another week or so, that would be good. Anyway, uh, talk to you soon. Bye.